Okay, and with that, we'll give it away to Christine Peterson. Okay. Okay, so the title of the talk, first of all, who am I? I'm Christine Peterson. I'm a co-founder of Foresight Institute, which is um, uh, one of the think tanks looking at nanotechnology and other transformative technologies. Um, you heard earlier, I'm the coiner of the term open source software. So every time one of you says the term open source and I hear you, I get a little nano thrill. And that means I get multiple nano thrills per day out of that. So I, it's, it's, my, it's my claim to fame. Um, I also advise the Machine Intelligence Research Institute and the uh, Global Healthspan Policy Institute. So the name of this talk, and it's not going to be just a talk because I'm going to do a little, little discussion and then we're going to do an interactive thing. We're going to actually change the world while having fun during the talk. So the name of the talk is Change the World While Living the Good Life. We're all here having a good life. This has been a blast. This conference is really fun. As long as we're here, let's do something to make the world a better place right now. And I think, I think it'll work fine. So, it's, we, we all know it's relatively easy to change the world while not living the good life, right? You can burn yourself out doing charitable work all over. Any nonprofit will be happy to help you spend your entire life giving away your time for free and being miserable at home because you have no money. So the goal is that, and, and then you burn out and the whole thing doesn't work. So the goal is how do you change the world in a positive way while having a good life? And how do you do that for many years in a row, like 30 years? How do you keep going without burning out? So that's what we're gonna talk about. Okay, how do you do it while having enough resources to have a lot of fun in your life? So the first question is, what do you mean by the good life? Everybody has a different definition, right? Um, you want to be able to pay your bills without getting all stressed out. You want to be able to have some control over your time so you can take time off. You, many of us want to travel. Some of us want to have a family, maybe own our own house. And some of us also want intellectual adventure. Uh, we want to know fascinating people and do exciting work with them to make the world a better place. And some of us want all these things. So how do we, once you know what your profile is for what is a good life, how can you do that while also making the world a better place? Okay, there's a multiple ways to go about this. I'm just gonna sketch out a few and then we're gonna try one right now. So a traditional way to do it is to have a decent paying traditional job that also happens to make the world a better place. Um, I know a hydrologist who uh, cleans up uh, groundwater that is polluted and he was called in to help stop the big Gulf oil spill in, in 2010. And he played a key role in stopping that. We all remember those visual images of the oil spilling into the Gulf. It was, a, it was appalling, right? Well. One guy went in and did the modeling to say, okay, here's how this, this should work. And he went in, he did that, and they followed his advice, and it worked. So I got all the inside story because I'm married to this guy, so I got to hear all about it. And so he, he fell into that because he had a job, a decent paying job, that just happened to give him the skill set to do that. And that's great if you happen to have that kind of a job. But it did, it, did give, it, did, it did give me a big benefit. He had a huge, he got honored, and there was this huge dinner with black tie, hundreds of people in D.C., and it was a thrill for me as his newlywed bride to see him honored that way. So that's one way. Another way you've all heard of, it's obvious, is you earn to give. In other words, you just have a regular job, you make money doing whatever, and then you either donate it or you use the freedom that buys you to donate time. So let me give you an example of, we all know how to give money. How do you give time and still have a good time? Make the world a better place and have a lot of fun. Well, right after I took my first job out of school as an engineer, like just like two or three months after I started the job, I, announced, I didn't know what the rules are in companies. I just announced to them that I was gonna take a few days off, unpaid, to go to Washington, D.C. and do some lobbying because there was a UN treaty that I and my friends th thought would interfere with space development, you know, the settlement of outer space. This was the UN Moon Treaty, 
And it basically said that all resources off the earth can't be privately owned. Now, that, you know, to those of us who now look at things like the, the companies that are trying to private space launches, p companies that want to do asteroid mining, no, that, that, the asteroid mining really wouldn't make any sense. You couldn't do it. So we wanted to prevent the scenario where that wasn't going to happen. So I was just a kid. Well, I didn't know anything, but we all went down to DC and lobbied against this treaty. And the US never did sign that treaty. And so now we have asteroid mining companies. So one thing people seem to forget is you have some freedom, especially if you're willing to take time off to do this stuff. If you say to your boss, it's OK, you don't have to pay me for those days. Now, whether the government permits that or not is another question. So that's another option. A third option is you work full time for a nonprofit. I did this for a long time for Foresight. Um, Chelsea told us earlier today about the income model for that. One of them is earned income. In other words, you provide profit, you provide services and products, and you get paid. And as long as it fits your mission, it's all tax free. Now there's a big benefit. Okay. You can, you can do well off that, and sh I think she did a great job of explaining it. But someone asked, well, what do you do if you don't have a product or service that you can sell that fits your mission? Well, then you have to go and talk to individual donors or corporations. I talk to individual donors. So, um, and what's the easiest way to raise money? Well, the easiest raise, way to raise money is to talk to people with a lot of money. We call them high net worth individuals or rich people wealthy people. And so if you have a nonprofit and you care a lot about your cause, and if it's a cause that, that is pretty, is something other people care about, out there, there are some people, high net worth individuals, who are going to get excited about that. So what you need to do is talk to them and connect with them and let them see that you want to make a difference. And the nice thing about these people is these are people generally who often self-made. They made their own money. So they tend to be smart. They've been successful at whatever they've been doing. And because these are, these are people who are interested in your cause, they're benevolent people. They're nice people. These are not jerks, right? These aren't rich jerks. These are rich, cool people. These are people who you actually want to know. They just happen to have money. They have a lot more money than you do. So if you're going to do that, you, what you have to do is connect with them and explain to them that, they, that you know they don't have time to do this stuff, but you do, right? And so if they want to turn their money into results, you'll do, you'll do the work. And you make a deal with them. I'll do the work if you can put up the money, um, and we'll make this happen. So it's a win-win-win, right? They win, you win, and the cause wins. Now, so... The way, so how do you get any security out of this? Well, it, let's say there's a nonprofit that does this work. You personally have to be the one that interfaces with these individuals. And you may think, well, I can talk to rich people. Of course you can talk to rich people. They're just, they're just people who got lucky in a way. I mean, they, we all work really hard, right? Some of us, and you know, right, in your past, you probably know some friends have done well. And they worked very hard, just like you did, plus they had some luck as well. Okay, which is great. We're all happy for them. But now it's time to work on broader goals. And they want to work on broader goals. So why? So there's two reasons you want to be the one to do the interfacing. Um, number one is job security. A nonprofit will not fire the person who brings in the donations. It's just not going to happen, right? Because the whole thing falls apart. So if you want to have a secure position in a nonprofit, Bring in the money. Get, get good at it. Now, what am I talking about? I'm talking about fundraising. Oh, I hate fundraising. I hate asking for money. I hear you. I, we all feel that way. It feels like begging. But that's, you, need to, you need to turn your head around about 180 degrees and realize you're not begging for money for yourself. It's, the purpose is not to support you. You're not sitting around eating bonbons watching television. You're out there working your butt off because you share a goal with this individual and he or she wants this stuff to happen. I mean, they may want it to happen even more than you do. You're all on the same team. You're almost doing them a favor, right? The reason you're making this offer is you've got skills. 
You can make something happen they really want. So we're on a team, okay? So there's another reason why you want to be the interface to the high net worth individuals. Some of these folks are really cool people. And not only do they, um, they're benevolent, they care, they're smart and accomplished, they have great parties. And you can get invited to parties like that. They have fantastic conferences. You know, something like this, but where you have to pay a lot to get in. Well, if you know all these people, you can get invited to these places. They have homes around the world. You might get invited to these places. It's fun. It's fun to do this. So if you can just get over this, oh, I hate fundraising, I hate asking for money. Don't think of it that way. Think of it as, you know, I can inspire people to join our team. If, they, if all they have is time, that's, that's fine. If they have money and they don't have time, you know, wealthy people don't have time, let them give money. That's what they want to do. They want to write that check. So if you can just see it a totally different way, it gets much more fun. Okay. So, all right. So then there's the last one, and this is the one we're going to experiment with today, which I think of it as it's a hit and run donation of time, judgment, and skill to a particular goal that you want to promote. So this whole open source thing was a hit and run thing that, that I did. I am not a programmer. I'm not a professional open source person. I can't code at all. Um, however, I had become aware that we called it free software at the time. Free software was an important goal, an important cause that a lot of my friends who are programmers cared intensely about and that they were having zero or pretty close to zero um, effectiveness at promoting because, in my view, because of the name of it, right? And I could see it every single time they tried to tell somebody about it, including me, They'd start launching into it about free software, and the first thing they'd have to say is, it's free as in freedom, not free as in beer. That was the, that was the way they would explain it, okay? So anybody who's new coming into this is going, okay, it's free as in freedom, not free as in beer. What does free as in beer mean? Is beer free? No, beer is not free. There's no such thing as a free lunch, so there's no such thing as a free beer. And so this is apparently about how not to get tricked by something. You can see this name is sending people off into hyperspace, right? They are totally confused by this name. They are not focusing at all on the purpose of why do we care about this? What's important about it? Now they're thinking about free beer. They're thinking about alcoholic beverages. They're, they're off on, and trying to figure out what are they possibly trying to say here. And of course, the problem is in English, the word free generally means zero price. When you hear free, you think, oh, no price. It's something I can just pick up and walk off with. That's the purpose of the word in English. Yes, it is also used to mean freedom, but that's usually not what it means. That's not the main reason that we use the term. That's not why it comes up. Now, in Spanish, they have two different names for this. There's um, gratis, which means free as in zero price, and libre, which means free as in freedom. So in Spanish, the name free software actually makes sense. And they still use it a lot in Spanish, because it works in Spanish. But in English, it totally doesn't work. So I wasn't the only person who noticed this problem. Um, a, lot of, a number of other people had noticed this problem. And they were kind of going, you know, we really need to do something about this, but nobody was actually doing something about it, right? There was no alternative suggested. So, you know, I, th I thought this is, we had a series of meetings, nothing was happening. And so I thought on my own time, I thought, well, open source, well, that would be better than what we have. It's not a great name. Nobody pretends it's a great name, but it's better than one that's actively misleading. Um, so, I, and I had no standing in the community. I could not make an announcement saying, hey, I've decided we should try this name. Progr open source, these free software programmers would have zero interest in my input in this area. They're, th they're all about coding. If you don't code, forget it. So I let somebody else do the introduction. Um, 
And they had a meeting and they decided, well, there's two options, free, open source or sourceware. That was the other one, sourceware. It's also better than free software. Um, sourceware is a perfectly good alternative to free software. It gets across the basic idea that you get the source code. So that is a big improvement. They decided for open source, but we don't pretend it's a great name. It's just better than a really sucky name, OK? And guess what? The people who organize this conference need our help because they have a really sucky name for their thing right now. They do. They do. No, they do. Here's the thing. The core team who organized this fantastic meeting, and we all owe them for that, are into a particular thing that is important to them. And I think it's a good idea. So I think we should just take a few minutes here and see if we can fix the problem they've got. So here's the deal. This group, some of them call themselves Georgists, Georgists, and the, the ideas are Georgism, OK? Now, an, um, 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 a little clearer name that they use for what they're into is the land value tax. Now, that is clearer. What is the term, and then why do they use the term George and Georgia? This is all started by a guy named Henry George. And if you start to hear about this, you will eventually hear about Henry George and all that. So does anybody care about Henry George? No, not. See, if you're Georgists, you guys are the ones who haven't noticed the problem, OK? Yeah, that's very nice. You know what? In general, you're not going to get people interested by talking about Henry George at all. And if you use that term Georgist and Georgism, what, you know, I came into this with a friendly, you know, I came in on the, web, on, the, on the Facebook page. I was immediately friendly to the idea. I've been struggling now for months to understand it. But OK, so when I hear that term Georgist, what do I think of? Well, George, Georgist. It sounds kind of old fashioned, which makes sense because he was a long time ago. But it triggers for me like King George. There were a bunch of King Georges. So maybe the Georgists wore the red coats in the American Revolution. Maybe that's who the Georgists are, and Georgism was the other side of the American Revolution. Or maybe it's about George Washington, so it's the other side of the American Revolution. Nothing about, you know, we are not making progress here, right? So we, we, I'm going to, let's do a thought experiment and assume we're all on the side now of this, of this idea, right? Later on, we can debate whether it's the world's best idea. Let's just assume it's, it's a great idea. So we're trying to fix this problem now. So my first suggestion is, let's get away from Georgist, George, Henry George, Georgism. No, I don't want to hear about that. You know, it is not helpful. OK, now let's think about the other more modern term of land value tax. Is this an attractive name for an idea? No, it is not an attractive name for an idea. What's wrong with it? Well, it has the word tax in it. We don't like the word tax. Whenever you hear about a such and such tax, if it's a new tax, you immediately assume it's not revenue neutral. It's a new tax that we're going to pay on top of all the taxes we're already paying. That is always the assumption because it's generally true, right? Generally, government, when they add a tax, they usually do not get rid of an old tax. So it's normal and natural that human beings have a negative reaction when they hear that word tax. OK, now, yes, it is a tax, right? I mean, it's not like we're going to hide that. There is a tax involved. So the word will come up eventually. But what we're talking about now is when we meet a new person, like I was very recently, coming into this idea, you know, for, OK, we decided not to use George and Georgism. That's all gone. Does the third word I hear about it have to be tax? No, it does not, right? If they had named, the, if, you know, Obamacare, right? Did they name it Required Private Health Insurance Purchase Act? Would it have passed with a name like that? No, right? No, they called it the Affordable Care Act. Oh, we all want affordable care. Who could argue with that, right? It, you know, whether you like Obamacare or not, it's a good name, right? And that's what we're focusing on now is the, how do we fix the name of this 
idea because we're assuming, and I, I actually think it is a good idea, right? Um, here's, okay, what's the idea? Some, how many of you know what the idea? You already know. How many of you do not really know what is the idea? Okay, here's the idea. It's very, I think I got the basics of it. It's taken me a lot of work because the more somebody knows about this, the more down the rabbit hole they go when they try to explain it, okay? It's a very simple idea, really. And it's, guys, if it's okay if I don't get all the bells and whistles right. This is the intro, right? So there's really only two parts to this idea. The basic idea is don't tax good things. Tax things that are either bad or neutral, right? So good things are savings, investment, work, you know, profit, tr sales. Those are all good things. So don't tax those things. Tax things that are either bad, like pollution, or things that are neutral, like land. So taxing pollution, we'd heard about the carbon tax, right? So that's one way to do it. Uh, they have their own issues. Right now we're focusing on, OK, why do land tax? Well, pretty much because it's really easy to see. It's, you know, there's a, there's a, it's hard to hide land. We know exactly how much of it there is. It's, you know, if you, can, you can just figure it out geometrically. How much is there, and you generally know who owns it. Boom, you're good, OK? Compared to figuring out who's polluting, it can be much easier. So don't tax good things. Tax things that are neutral or bad. That's a simple thing, right? And the other thing, and I don't know if it's how important this is, they think it's very important, that if you have two parcels of land next door to each other, one has a house and one doesn't, you tax them both the same. You tax all the land at its highest zoned value. In other words, if a land, piece of land is zoned to have a house, you tax it as if it had a house. That's the basics, okay? You can see the second point a lot of people may never care about, right? The first point is this very simple point. Anybody can understand it. So what we need to do is come up with a term that does not have the word tax in it, that gets across some fundamental benefit of this economic system. So something with fairness in it, yeah? Right, we need the mic. Mike. Equal, no. Equal rights to land sounds like communism. We're not going that way, yeah. Interesting. Keep, keep thinking. I like the way you're thinking. We just need to keep going. Keep going. Oh, wait. I have to repeat the, okay. So we had what was the first? Equal rights to land. Commonwealth contribution. Value exemption. I like exemption. It sounds like you're going to get a deal. It's based on what? I can't. I can't hear her. Can. Okay. All right. Keep going. Any rent sharing? Okay. I hear you about rent sharing, but there's a problem there. And it's similar to the problem with the word free, which is rent to most people means something totally different. Like 99.9% like .9 of people think it means what you give the landlord. So that's not, it's going to be earth sharing. That's how we got the name of the website. It's an interesting, interesting idea. I, earth sharing, OK, OK, keep going. You know, we may not get it right today. We're almost done. He's going to throw me off any minute. Common ground. We don't have to mention anything about that. It could be like the common ground principle. Something like that. You don't need to have anything about taxes or, or contributions. That is like a side thing. Yeah. OK, something about value, something about productive. What? Oh, geoism. All right, somebody, you know, this is clearly, we're not going to, first of all, we here aren't going to make this decision, right? This is a decision the community will make, and to some extent, the media makes for you. The way we knew the open source term was working was when the number of media hits went up. They liked the term, and they promoted it for us. And, and that just showed that it was a term. It, what it showed is there was a pent-up demand for these ideas that had been held back 
by the defective previous name. So this community will know it's got its new name when there's seems like a, a, a significant tick up in interest in the ideas because I think it's a, it, it deserves more coverage. It's a good idea. It's just that the, the name is not, we're not quite where we need to be on the name. So somebody hopefully will correlate all these names. The, the comment, this discussion needs to continue within the community until the group comes up with a name that you want to try, just like open source did. They had a meeting, they voted, they picked a name to try, they threw it out there and it went, and went up really well. But maybe it'll take more than one effort, right? If it hadn't gone, yes, do you have a comment? Right, and, and if we had like a whole day, I mean this, you folks, you Georgists, <clears throat> us, I'll go back, we're all on the team, right, at least right now, us Georgists need to have like a one day workshop where we just beat the heck out of this and keep pushing and keep pushing until somebody goes, that's good enough, that's much better than what we have. It doesn't have to be a perfect name, it just has to be no, you know, nothing about George, no word about tax. And, and it has to be some, has a fl positive flavor to it, something about fairness, something about productivity, something, you know, some, something motherhood and apple pie. But it should have some meaning, like open source, there is a meaning there, yes. Yeah, what about productivity subsidy? Productivity subsidy. See, now we're getting some interesting, who could, who could argue against a productivity subsidy? It's so much obviously a good idea, so, you know, Keep, keep pushing on this, we're getting better. You know, actually some of these were great, yeah. Anti-sanction. Okay. What's that? Fairway. Interesting, cute, it's a cute idea. Any other ideas? What? Oh, fairway. It's like a fairway. Yeah, commons fairway. I mean, these are creative ideas, yes. Equity benefit. Equity benefit. You see, now we're getting positive, friendly, warm, fuzzy terms. And only you in the community. It's a whole lot better than tax and George. I mean, we're, it's better than. It doesn't have to be perfect. It really doesn't. It just has to be a lot better than what we have. I heard what I sort of liked about the name. Was, uh, pay rent only. So everyone knows just, just rent. rent. Just, right. just rent? Just, just rent. If, don't if, pay taxes, just pay rent. One thing that I like about just rent and stuff like that is that it has, a, a, it has, an, it has an implication that all those other taxes you are paying are going to go away. And, and that's kind of appealing. It has a bill that is just as well. So that kind of Oh, cute, cute. So, okay, somebody needs to write these all down. Just rent. And it, it just has another meaning, right? Justice. So that's good. It's not, it has not just only, but justice. It's a cute double meaning. Okay, so we have a lot of very clever ideas here. I didn't have any ideas. You guys had the ideas. All I'm saying is let's make the name change to the community. Yes. Community sharing. Opportunity sharing. Two very positive words. That's, and you know, it ha it, you want it to be true, right? Like open source. It's true. It's a true fact about about free software. It was open source. It's you know, it's a central point. It is almost the central point. Um, it's maybe not the most important point. I think actually the freedom part is actually even more important. There just was no way in English to say it simply. So I think that was it. I think you guys did awesome. Thank you so much. So email me at peterson.org, peterson at foresight.org. That's me. And come see us at foresight.org. Thank you. You know, if there are any questions, pe people could take them out. If, you, if, you, if anyone has questions, five minutes, we could do that. Seems like the crowd, you've roused the crowd. So, well, we uh, were doing some brainstorming. We could keep going. Yeah, I mean, it, it, maybe people have questions for you, though, too. 
They might. Anybody have questions other than, like questions, how do I make my nonprofit, you know, work better, and how do I have more fun, yeah? You have to talk really loud, this fan is so loud. If you can do a service that fits your mission, her, what Chelsea said about doing one is a great model. And she is 100% right that if it's something you can figure out how to do, that is a great way to, make, to, to bring in resources. And then, as she explained, you know, there are people who can afford to pay, and then you take that money and subsidize the people who can't afford to pay, and it's awesome. Um, for Foresight, we work on things that are super long-term. There's no, you know, we do, we do some services and products in terms of like conferences, stuff like that, but we need to really do our mission, we need to use a lot more resources. And so we go to the high net worth individuals and make our explanations and they get on board and they say, this is great stuff. And I'll tell you, it's a, you know, it's a lot easier to go to a high net worth individual and get a big check than it is to get, you know, a hundred times more checks from, that are a hundred times smaller that's harder. If you can find somebody who loves your vision and has a big checkbook, because these people, they can just pull out the checkbook. They actually have money in the bank to write these big checks. And, it's, it's, and you can go out and, and you can deploy those funds immediately instead of wasting huge amounts of time fundraising. You know, it is, it's, it's, it's tedious to raise a lot of small donations. I mean, it's, it's, it has its own rewards, but it's, it's very time consuming. Yes, sir. Well, I don't, th that's true, and you can make two pitches. One is the one to the rational person saying, well, you know this is not sustainable. But I really think in this case, it's generally appealing to someone's emotions. And these folks, there's, as I was saying, they're benevolent. The ones, you know, there are, there are different kinds of people. There are high net worth individuals who are jerks, and there are high net worth individuals who are wonderful people. And I think most people are good people, and that means most high net worth individuals are good people. They care about the world, they care, I mean, don't we all feel awful when we see you know, the homeless people and people who, you know, they have mental illness problems and addiction problems and they're, you know, former military out on the streets lying. I mean, we all want to help that. So the question is, how do you do that? I don't think you have, you don't always have to just make a cold pitch to somebody rationally. We all, you know, we all want to make the world a better place. We want to help our fellow people. And especially once you've made as much money as you need, most of those people start to look around in the world and go, now what do I do? You know, some of them just go, I want to make more money. And they keep going on that. And, you know, whatever. But, you know, most of them want to make a difference. So you just have to connect with the people who care. They're, they're, I think they're out there. Yes, in the back. Yes. In terms of the foundations, I have, you know, I've never even bothered with the foundations. I, you know, because I'm in Silicon Valley, to me, it makes more sense to find people who have big budgets, who are individuals who can just whip, whip out that checkbook and do it right now. Um, 
I, the idea of going through a long process and filling out these giant paperwork, and uh, I just have never been able to do it. Yeah, I just wanted to be the founder of the vision, a cooperative of all the moments, or a process where a group of people, like the worker co-op, decides how they're doing You know, there are philanthropy networks, there are groups, hmm? We, we have to start that. Okay, this is the last one. This is the last one. There are groups of, of individual philanthropists who share information among themselves. Um, I've never been able to present to one of those, and I th I'm not even sure they take presentations. Well, I don't know. I've never been into them. I've never, I only know one person who's in them, and I don't really know how they work. Um, I just work with individuals, um, and that's, been, that's kept our group going, but we're, we're relatively small. Thank you so much. You guys were great.